This episode of Game On brought to you by Ford, featuring voice-activated sync app link. Now you can control smartphone apps with your voice so you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Check it out in the 2012 Ford Fiesta and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Squarespace.com, fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 15% off your new account for six months, go to Squarespace.com and use offer code GAMEON2. That's Game On and the number two. It's Sunday, February 5th, and for the love of God, run, Bo Jackson, run! I hope you like the crunchy feeling of sand between your thighs. We head to Dubai for an exclusive look at 2K Studios' Spec Ops The Line. Ernie Klein, the author of Ready Player One, the best-reviewed novel about video games in the last 20 years, talks to his old pal Brian about the book and what will have to change in his grip for the movie adaptation. All of your mistranslations are belong to us. We count down the top five lines that get more mixed up than a wayward water bug in a blender. Yes, it's Super Bowl Sunday, and I'm not wearing a cup for no reason. Who wants to nut-check me? It's time for Game On! For Game On, I'm Brian Brushwood. And I'm Veronica Belmont. I am very excited about our special guest tonight. How do you know Ernie Klein? Believe it or not, we both got our start. We're both from Austin, Texas, and we used to perform at the same venue, the Electric Lounge down just off of 6th Street or 5th Street. Mm -hmm. He did Slam Poetry, and I did Bizarre Magic, and I actually worked his first fundraiser for Fanboys. Ooh, you know, I have to say I'm a little annoyed because you promised me back at Dragon Con last oh year God, this... that you would help me get Ernie Klein on Sword and Laser, which yeah. is my sci-fi fantasy show. No buzz marketing, I'm just saying. Well, okay, and I wanted to have him on NSFW and said we're compromising and we're going to split them. I get an arm and a leg. All right, fair enough. You get his goatee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> of course, this show doesn't happen without you. We record live every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at live.twit.tv, or you can contribute stories to our subreddit or tweet reactions to at twitgameon. And of course, remember, when the game is over, the carnage truly begins. It's Shut Up and Play, where me, Veronica, and the rest of the Game On crew play against you guys at home. Today, we are playing DC Universe Online. And also, later in the show, we'll tell you why this happened. Can you show it, Chad? You know you've got it. Tell me you've got the photo. The Get money the photo! shot. Oh, yeah. Yes, there it is. That happened. Twitch shaved into the back of my head. It's, it's not still there, is it? Is it mostly gone? <laughs> it's mostly gone. Okay. I would say it's 90% gone. We can fix that if <laughs> the you grudge, want to. Let me tell you, the grudge match is they're not messing around. And I'm seriously going to trounce Glenn, and he's definitely going to get something shaved into his head today. All right. Well, while you were trying to remember that one girl you knew with Facebook stop op options, uh, here's what happened this week in the system update. <laughs> Ever had a really bad idea, like a create a console peripheral that no one wants to buy and put your company in massive financial peril kind of bad idea? Well, then you have a friend in THQ. CFO Paul Bacino admitted this week that the U-Jaw tablet for Xbox and PlayStation sold $100 million under expectations, and the units they did move were sold at a lower price than expected. Unsurprisingly, the company announced firings of 240 employees. Whoopsie doodle. And while we're on the subject of horrifying, depressing sales numbers, Sony released their fourth quarter earnings, which can be accurately described like this. Why is Captain Picard making his eyes kiss the inside of his hands? A net loss of $2.04 billion is a good start. Sony's Consumer Products and Services Division, the one that runs PlayStation, posted a $1.09 billion drubbing. They blame market conditions, a flood in Thailand that affected supply chain, and bad exchange rates for the awful holiday quarter, as well as the uncontrollable crying that's been going on ever since. Game Informer released three exclusive still shots for the new Naughty Dog release, The Last of Us. Among the revelations, they are awesome, we want to play the game immediately, and Last of Us will add another chapter in the rich zombie history of Pittsburgh. The Steel City has previously played host of the undead in many of the Romero films. I wonder if there's a side mission in Last of Us where you have to find the last remaining meats, cheese, coleslaw, and fries for a Pimanti Brothers sandwich. Mmm. -hmm. 
Great news, cheapskates. Two MMOs have gone free to play. EverQuest, the legendary franchise which served as the jumping off point for many MMO addicts, will not even cost you a dime to relive your former glory or find out what your older brother was always running his stupid mouth off about. Also, Rift is now offering Rift Lite in a limited but never-ending trial for those who are curious enough to play but not curious enough to part with a few shekels to shed the level caps and map restrictions. But wait, vultures, there is yet more news in the realm of freebies. When you download the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer demo as a free subscriber to Xbox Live, you will automatically be upgraded to gold status for a limited time. This is so everyone can fully experience the wonder and majesty of the multiplayer cooperative Mass Effect 3 experience. But 1UP.com asks the million dollar question. If Xbox Live has to jump through these Cirque du Soleil style technical hoops to get everyone to play the multiplayer, isn't it time they bit the bullet and offered it free, like Sony does for PSN? Yeah, seriously. So if Microsoft is finally doing away with Microsoft points, is it time to make basic online multiplayer free? I've always thought it's ridiculous that you can't play for free on the Xbox. It should have been free a while ago. Yeah. So do you think they're actually going to crumble? I hope so. I mean, maybe if this goes really well, they'll kind of, you know... I guess the problem is... Be like, I haven't oh, this really... worked out pretty well. Do, do you hear... I mean, you talk to more console gamers than I do, and I, I'm, I'm, I actually don't even think about my Xbox Live Gold subscription except for the one time per year... When it just when it renews. renews, yeah, you're like, like, okay, oh, that yeah. happens. Oh, well, I guess there's nothing I can do now. So it's like, I mean, it's smarter than them to keep doing it, but I just don't know if, if there's this big outpouring of people who would be like, down with the fees. Well, why wouldn't you want it to be free? Well, sure, Why but... wouldn't you want multiplayer to just be automatically built into your gameplay experience? You should want it, but the question is, are people angry enough about it? That's I'm happy, why I I'm happy they're switching. They're getting rid of Microsoft points. I think that's a really good idea. I just want my money to be money. Yep. In things, when I'm buying stuff, I want to know how much I'm actually spending. And, ah, math is hard. I don't like doing the whole converting into points thing in my See, head. See, I just finally got good at it yeah. now. I know what stuff actually costs. But I'm excited. I'm excited for multiplayer in Mass Effect 3. I'm excited for people to get to experience playing with a gold membership for a while, um, it's 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 a good amount of money to pay for for a gold subscription. It, it is a big hurdle, and I think yeah. it keeps a lot of people who otherwise might be into multiplayer gaming from ever even trying it. Yeah. Well, guess what? War is hell. But in Spec Ops line, the line, it's also dry and dusty. So this week, Veronica had some alone time with the game. What did you think? I thought it was great. So it's this is a, um, if you haven't heard of the game before, it's a third-person shooter from Yeager Development in Berlin and published by 2K Games. And it's a little bit different from the other shooters we've seen out there. It's very, very story-driven. It's, um, it's a story of Captain Martin Walker and his Delta Force Bravo team. So there's three main characters that you're really interacting with throughout the whole game. And you definitely see this progression of their emotions as they go through uh, the city of Dubai. Um, they're going in to save the 33rd Regiment, uh, who they've lost contact with. They hear a distress signal. They're trying to figure out where these guys are, what happened to them. And the, the scenery of Dubai is almost like another character in the game. Wow. I mean, it's, it's obviously, it's, it's a desert. If you know anything about Dubai, you know it's very extravagant. It's in the middle of a desert. It's been built up to this huge, like, majestic, gorgeous city in the desert. But it's not really, it doesn't really seem that sustainable. And right. this game kind of points that out in a big way. So from the footage I'm seeing right here, it seems to have a lot of cover play dynamics. It mm -hmm. reminds me a lot of Gears of War, but it seems so bright and sunny. What, what does it feel like? Well, it does feel like you're in the desert. I mean, there's sand traps everywhere, there's deadly sandstorms, but you can use that either to your advantage or you can make that a big disadvantage for the people you're fighting against. You see little, like, visual cues if there's sand coming out of some plastic glass, like, window, for example. You can tell that that structure is not uh, stable enough, so you can shoot it and actually bury all the guys in sand. So a bunch of contextual clues to Act use the environment, sort of a Bioshock mm -hmm. element to it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's squad-based, so it, you get to uh, like tell your squad members to take out certain guys. You can give them commands. And that's all situational. It's all dependent on what's going on around you at that moment. So all the commands aren't always the same. So that's a pretty cool feature as well. Um, it really illustrates like the harshness of war, the moral ambiguity of being in that kind of situation. Your team kind of starts breaking down under the stress of being in this environment. And you can hear that in your interactions with them. How, how far along through the game did you make it? Um, so I played the first few levels. I played for a while. And then I got to play more, um, which we can't talk about right now because there's an embargo that we can't talk about until... So you can't mention the, the space aliens that show up. Exactly. Those. <laughs> and what I did love, though, is that uh, Walker is actually voiced by Nolan North. Okay, so wait, why do little, I know that name? Who's Nolan North? He's Drake from Uncharted. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, gotcha, so you gotcha, get, gotcha. You get this little, like, oh, it's Drake. But he's not. Yeah. I mean, he's a totally like, different um, character. 
Yeah, but I, I know the guy fun. that plays uh, Spike Spiegel from uh, Cowboy Bebop is in like eight billion different animes, so it's the same thing every well, time I hear we, his voice. When we were talking to Liam last week, like you, if you're a trained voice actor, you can do a lot of different parts and do them very well. Right. And uh, Nolan North is definitely one of those guys. Um, so it's going to be out in spring 2012, and it's going to be on PC, Xbox, and PS3. Right on. So definite buy on your in your verdict. I, I I'm, I'm excited to play it. I'm not a huge shooter person, but I think that this is the kind of game because it is so story driven that. I can kind of sink my teeth into it and get into it and be excited about playing it. We also have a special interview with the guys over at Jaeger Games talking about Spec Ops The Line, so stay tuned. So Spec Ops The Line is a third-person military-themed shooter. Uh, It takes place in Dubai uh, after a series of sandstorms has ravaged the area. And you play as uh, Captain Martin Walker, who's sent in to find uh, Colonel John Conrad, who had been originally sent in to bring back survivors a- after these sandstorms. And as you get to Dubai, you realize that things are not quite what you were expecting. Dubai is an awesome setting just because it has this surreal feel to it. The, the buildings, the architecture, everything that you see there is just, it's, it's otherworldly. And with, with the addition of, you know, the destruction of, of all these sandstorms, you have this, this great juxtaposition of, of this beauty versus, you know, this destruction. And it, it really allows us, it gives us a great backdrop just visually, but it also gives us a lot of things that we can do with gameplay for, for sand gameplay, sand avalanches, you've got the sandstorms and things like that. There's a lot of moral ambiguity in this game. There's a lot of things that seem to be the right thing to do, but then later turn out to not be the case. Can you speak a little bit to that? Well, that's, I think that's one of the things that we've, we've done really well and that we really were pushing for is to put the player in a position where he feels uncomfortable. It's, you're, this is war. War is hell, and there's not always an easy right and wrong decision. And even, even as you go through, you're fighting different, uh, different factions of enemies, Sometimes you're fighting American soldiers and you don't know why, but they're shooting at you and your only choice if you want to survive is to fight back. And so we really, we really like uh, what that gives us for both storytelling and even gameplay. It, it varies things up to be able to, to have that kind of the gray areas um, instead of the black and white and, and making it obvious. So this is the million dollar question. There are a lot of military shooters out there. What makes Spec Ops the line different? Spec Ops The Line is different because of the story that we're telling. This is, this is not your John Wayne hero run through, shoot everything, and you're the winner. It's, it's, a, it's a much more realistic take on what uh, war is like, what battle is like. And it, it really, like I said, it puts, it puts the player in a position of feeling the consequences of their actions and, and really getting, uh, evoking an emotional response from them. And I think that's something that we've, we've, we've really been trying hard to make that work. And from the playtesting that we've done and the, you know, the demos we've shown, we've, we've really hit that sweet spot, I think. We saw a lot of new stuff today. Can you tell us about some of the new stuff that you're showing off? So uh, one of the things that we're showing off today is actually uh, it's new, but at the same time, it's old. It's, uh, we actually showed the E3 demo uh, that we showed from two years ago. And this is the first time we're showing kind of the, the, re, the, um, the redone version of this, where we've, ch- we've changed a few things up, but now it's actually something that you get to play. And uh, I hope, I, I don't know what decisions you made. I didn't get to watch your Probably your very play bad through. decisions. <laughs> there is, that's the thing. They're all bad. Okay, good. <laughs> it's bad or worse. No, but the, um, <clears throat> one of the things we showed there uh, was the choice to actually whether you could save uh, the civilians or not, and that's so you didn't, didn't save, I didn't the, civilians. save the, okay. the civilians. Okay, well no. then, I went then the I guy. picked the wrong example. <laughs> but we're also showing um, the scene uh, at the end of the of the demo with the um, the mortar scene, and that is that is actually another thing that we're really. It's kind of the, as I was talking about the uh, how the the squad changes throughout. It's that's kind of their breaking point because this is where things all of a sudden it goes from worse to really, really, really worse, and you get to see you really start to see from this point on in the game. And I hope you buy it and, and play it. Uh, you get to see you know how what that does to these guys and you know the, the horrible things that they start to witness and how that affects them. You know, this is this is a it's a very different experience that uh, I think that gamers who are into the, the shooters, whether first person or third person, will will really enjoy just the gameplay of it. But also, we're bringing something new to the table with with a dark, nar- mature narrative that is uh, it's something different, and it, it really kind of it evokes an emotional response from the player. And it's I, it's been great seeing you know all of our all of the uh, play tests and and uh, demos that we've been giving. We get a really good response from that. So like loved people to look 
out for that. And when is the game coming out? Uh, spring 2012. And platforms? Uh, Xbox 360, PS3, and PC. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bad video game translations are a rite of passage. We studied the top five moments in old English history in this week's Leet Sheet. Talk about the top five best mistranslations of video games. Number five, all your base are belong to us. Cats, zeroing. A quote so silly it launched a thousand memes. More accurately translated, it means all of your bases have been taken over by the opposition. But now it can mean anything, including thumping rhythm and dance tracks and a slang term for crack rock, both of which might have made for better games. All of your poorly refined cocaine are belong to us, which is why I'm talking like a mush mouth weirdo. A winner is you. Pro Wrestling. Not the winner, the indefinite A winner. There are many winners. You are only one. So before you get a big head about pinning your 8-bit adversary, just remind yourself that you've achieved nothing of real statistical merit. And just like hundreds of thousands of other winners around the globe, you are nothing special. Which is probably why your parents got divorced. Congratulations. You have completed a great game and proved the justice of our culture. Now go and rest, our heroes. Ghostbusters. NES. Okay, these games were written in Japanese. Japanese people don't know how to speak English the way we do. These things happen. We could spend the next 15 seconds making fun of it, or we could all collectively close our eyes and imagine Bill Murray saying this quote at the end of an all-new Ghostbusters movie we've created using our imagination. See, wasn't that better? I feel asleep, Metal Gear. I feel asleep is really a very deep thought. Are we all asleep in some way? Don't we all let things slide when we shouldn't? Your girlfriend cheats on you and you forgive her? Your local politician pilfers public trust to line his own pockets? Thousands of people around the world are living in squalid conditions with lifespans more akin to the dark ages. And what do we do about it? Nothing. Well, not anymore. I'm wide awake. I am the tipping point that leads to a better humanity where we all respect human rights and enjoy this one precious life to the fullest. Oh, oh wait, you meant fell asleep. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, my mistake. Uh, would, would you like a pillow? What, what were we talking about? Yo, gangsta, get ready to gangbang. Bust a move, PlayStation. Uh, listen, I don't know what you are planning on busting, but this is uncalled for. I am a married man, and to be honest, you even saying that makes me uncomfortable. I love a good team-building exercise as much as the next guy, but this is really asking a lot. I guess there's two meanings for that phrase. Could mean criminal activity. I wonder which one they meant. Hey, what's my sister doing here? So the question is, is there another completely botched line that we totally spaced on? Hit us up at TwitGameOn on Twitter. That's at TwitGameOn, and we'll read the best of them at the end of the show. And Chad, during the break, just told me, he's like, seriously, they need to be sending him in. Otherwise, I don't get to talk on the show. Aww. So if you want Chad at the end, you got to hit him up on the Twitters. I feel asleep. <laughs> We all feel it. I feel a sad if Chad doesn't talk at the end of the show. All right, well, we're halfway done with the show, but please stop panicking. There's a lot more where this came from. Brian talks to his old buddy Ernie Klein about his book, Ready Player One, and if the movie adaptation will be better or worse than The Wizard. And we'll visit with our new YouTube correspondent who reviews from Dust and Rainbows and Unicorns. Um, but enough of me yammering. Let's find out who ponies up the coin for this garbage. Game On is brought to you by the fine folks at the Ford Motor Company and their Sync App Link. Sync App Link lets you control select apps from your smartphone using nothing but your voice commands. So your hands stay on the wheel, your eyes stay on the road, and your life stays in your body. With Sync App Link, you can do things like control Pandora or listen to your tweets with OpenBeak. All you have to do is just ask for your tweets and it reads them to you. Once your smartphone is linked to Pandora, for example, you can ask for custom stations just using your voice. Pandora, play Pendulum. You can select your favorite station, make a new one. You can bookmark songs to purchase, give songs a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And with OpenBeak, for example, you could just say read timelines or read replies. Sync App Link is built on an API platform that allows Ford to continue to work on it with developers in the app community to bring more and more apps to life with voice in your vehicle. Voice activated Sync App Link available on the 2012 Ford Fiesta. You can learn more about this and other technologies at Ford.com slash technology. And we are joined by Ernie Klein for direct from Austin, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us, Ernie. Appreciate it. Uh, dude, thanks for inviting me. This is awesome. This, this show seems right up my alley. <laughs> yeah, well, I was about to say, what's funny is uh, we, we were talking about, you know, we have all these different developers, people who do voice acting. And uh, when we were talking about we needed a big guest, and it was like, Ernie Klein, of course. I mean, the whole, your book is about games within games. Not only does half the book take place in a game, but there are so many references to so many games. You clearly are a child of gaming culture. 
It's true. Well, yeah, video games, uh, uh, like, I got my first uh, home video game console, I think, was the Atari in 1978, and that was like a it was like a bomb dropped on my childhood. So, uh, like, I was welded to my Atari for, uh, and then to my Nintendo, and then to my Sega, and then, you know, on and on. But probably just like you. So I've Brian. been saying this for, ever since Ready Player One came out. I've been so stoked about it. I, t- I keep telling people it's like the Da Vinci Code for geeks, right? Uh, for, the, for the five people left in America who haven't read your book already, what is the conceit for them? Um, uh, the idea is that uh, a video game designer uh, who's uh, kind of of my generation or of our generation, uh, born in the 70s and raised in the 70s and 80s, he uh, uh, invents a um, globally networked virtual reality called the Oasis. That's kind of like uh, Second Life and World of Warcraft and Facebook and everything that we know about the Internet kind of uh, 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 made as cool as possible and imagined, you know, like 35 years from now. So it's this sprawling virtual reality and the creator of this this virtual reality Uh, dies in the opening pages of the book and leaves his entire fortune and control of this virtual world that everybody, you know, uh, on the planet uses uh, to whoever can unlock these video game puzzles that he's left behind. He's created, kind of inspired by uh, Warren Robinette's Easter egg in the original Atari adventure. He uh, He's hidden like an Easter egg uh, inside the Oasis, and whoever finds it will inherit his fortune. So it's kind of, uh, has uh, was heavily inspired by Willy Wonka and, and uh, a lot of other things. Awesome. So, so much of the story takes place within the Oasis. I think more than half the book does. Do you see this as something we're actually going to be heading towards? Or do you feel like the importance of online worlds will continue to grow to a point where we just sort of exist in our meat space just to, to keep it alive? But meanwhile, we do our real living out inside a digital world? Um, it definitely seems possible. And it already seems like... Um we already live that way to some degree. Um, not just us, uh, you and I, but, you know, everybody... Um, uh, uh, is linked to this, like everybody has a handheld computer in their pocket that connects them to a, you know, a global computer network that they can access and, and uh, upload data to at all times. That's already, you know, um, if you would just extrapolate that 35 years, then being uh, kind of surrounded by that technology, it seems kind of inevitable. And what you, like, if you just look at the advancement of video games in the last 10 years and how much more real they've gotten, and then I was just trying to imagine, you know, what that's going to be like in 35 years, just trying to imagine the coolest possible uh, kind of a uh, platform for video games and communication and internet and everything kind of mashed together. So I would love, I would love for it to happen. So it, it would be a lot of fun, uh, but I don't know if it will. Hey, Ernie, I was going to ask you, so what do you think are the next big innovations in immersion in terms of video games? Cause that's really a big theme in the story itself. Yeah. Well, I did a lot of research, uh, into that when I was working on my book and it seems like the military is driving a lot of virtual reality, uh, technology haptics, the science of haptics, which is, making your body feel things uh, inside the game or inside the simulation. And just your video game controller vibrating, that's really rudimentary haptics. But the military is designing haptic gloves that uh, where you can grab an object inside the virtual space and then it stops your hand from closing and makes you feel like you're actually holding uh, holding this virtual object that doesn't exist. Awesome. As well as like, ha- yeah, as well as like haptic suits and things like that. So it just seems like the eventually once you start wearing your game controller, then the, and, you know, you have a visor that, uh, hides, you know, takes over your vision and all your other, you know, main senses, then you're going to be inside the video game. It just seems like uh, uh, the way that we're headed. Don't you guys think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Are you I, kidding me? That's yeah. amazing. In fact, I, I remember, uh, man, it must have been a decade ago going to SIGGRAPH. They had, uh, it was just a single pen object hooked on an arm, but you could trace the the dits and dots, uh, the, the pits inside of a expanded uh, CD. You, you, I mean, it's amazing. I got to imagine a decade later, the technology has advanced. So uh, you just finished a nationwide book tour where you drove your tricked out DeLorean all over the United States and you got to meet face to face with the kind of people uh, this, this book appeals to, the, the gamers born in the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s, I would assume. What did you notice about the people who were responding to the book? What did you notice when you got to interact with them face to face? Um, I was just shocked at like the, the wide range of people who really seemed to respond to the book. I thought that they would all look like me. They would be, you know, middle-aged white guys, uh, who grew up, you know, loving video games, but, um, men and women, kids who weren't even, you know, uh, anywhere, weren't alive in the eighties, uh, seemed to really dig this book for them. It works just like, uh, like a straightforward quest or like an adventure story. And the, the, uh, the eighties references and the stuff about, you know, old video games works like, you know, ancient mythology in an Indiana Jones movie. You don't necessarily know if, you know, uh, it's real or you don't have to know too much about it to understand who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. So that was the thing that really shocked me is that so many different kinds of people seem to dig it. And I thought I was just writing a book to try to please myself. And I thought that me and, you know, you, Brian, and maybe three other guys might dig it. So I was, I, you know, I continue to be shocked at, uh, at how many people uh, dig it and respond to it. 
how do you have all this stuff in your brain? All these little nods to pop culture things, movies, video games, TV shows, music. Do you just have like Wikipedia like on Dude, I will, file I will vouch for this. Time? This is all like, pure Ernie Klein. I sure did no research whatsoever. I mean, that's that is that's that's just Ernie. But I mean, I'll let him. <laughs> <laughs> but well, it's that way. But Brian's that way to a degree too, and I know that you are too, Veronica. I mean, I think it, w- the trick that I did was I just. Uh, you know, made the uh, uh, the eccentric billionaire in my book obsessed with all the same stuff that I grew up obsessed with and loving. And that way it was a way for me to pay tribute to all the stuff that I love and that I really responded to and also, you know, not have to do any extra research. I mean, I would still look things up online. Uh, the Internet, you know, made it very easy to write this book. Anytime I wasn't sure if I remembered something correctly, I could just look it up and double check it. But as far as just like composing the puzzles and the things that I wanted to mention in the book, it, I just did them in the way that, you know, you and I, Brian, would do in a conversation. You know, you reference movies and things all the time and uh, and you don't have to explain them because we're, you know, uh, we're all familiar with a lot of the same stuff. So I wanted to try to tell a story that way where I use that geek shorthand that we all use when we talk to each other to tell a story um, uh, so you can tell and you can convey so much more than the words on the page if you draw on all of pop culture. So that's what I was trying to do. And, and talking about movies, obviously, one of the big pieces of news is that Ready Player One is being made into a movie, or at least you, uh, if, if I remember correctly, you insisted that you write the screenplay as part of whatever movie deal would, was going forward. Uh, as you're yeah. writing it, I assume you're writing it still now, but, but what kind of uh, unique challenges do you have in translating the story? Because obviously the, the story itself is a fantastic mashup of so many different delightful intellectual properties, much the way Toy Story is. I got to imagine that's just a giant morass from an IP perspective as you try to make it something that can actually become a movie. Yeah, it, uh, it, um, well, the whole time I was writing the book, um, I was writing it kind of out of my frustrations of uh, being a screenwriter and the limitations of screenwriting and, and how hard it is to get what you write actually on the screen. So the whole time I was writing the book, it, uh, I just freed myself of that and said, I'm going to write a story that could never, ever possibly be a movie. I'm not even going to think about that. You know, I'm just going to try to tell uh, an exciting, fun story and just assume that it could never, because of all the the licensing, when I was writing it, I just assumed that uh, it could never be a movie. But of course, like you said, the movie rights sold the day after I sold the book to Random House and with me attached to write the screenplay. So then it became my job to try to figure out how to turn my infilmable book into a screenplay. And I just, uh, I actually worked on the screenplay uh before, uh, like about six, seven months, the first half of 2011, before uh, the book actually came out, right before I went on my book tour, I was uh, working on the screenplay adaptation. And since then, um, like, so I, I did the first kind of crack at taking this 400 page book and condensing it down into a 120 page movie and conveying a lot of what's in the book. And it was just the most painful, uh, uh, excruciating uh, writing process of my life. It was so hard, and it's because I was so close to it. I mean, it was, it was, it, it allowed me to uh, influence the, the direction that the adaptation would take and get the stuff that was really important to me that, that it be in the movie, um, you know, in that first draft. Um, but it was really hard. And, uh, and now there's a, another writer who's rewriting my draft. Um, Eric Eason is a really talented guy and I'm glad that he has taken over because at some point, like I got the bar as fall down as far downfield as I could take it because I wrote the book. So it's all very precious to me. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, at some point I'm, we're going to let somebody else make those decisions. And like you said, the, the, the big changes with the licensing, that's a real tricky thing. But the one thing that I have going for me is that it's Warner Brothers um, uh, who bought the, the film rights. And Warner Brothers is the biggest movie studio in the world, and they have the largest catalog of, of uh, you know, 80s music and uh, uh, 80s movies uh, as anyone. So um, there'll have to be some changing of, of licenses to match things that uh, Warner Brothers owns. But um, they're so, like, you know, they don't... Uh, they don't. They may not own, um, you know, uh, war games, but they own Better Off Dead. Things like that that will get swapped out. That will make watching the movie, I think, an interesting thing because the puzzles will be different than in the book, but they'll be in the same spirit as the puzzles in the in the movie. That's my hope, anyway. That it's all still very. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, movie viewers will oftentimes skew younger than, than than I don't know book readers. Was there any pressure for you to, uh, I, I guess, newify some of the references to make them '90s references instead of '80s references, or did they just love everything as it was written? Well, like initially, like the, what they loved is uh, it's Warner Brothers and they they make their they make big, you know, kind of summer movies. And that's what they envision for Ready Player One. And it needs to be a movie that they sell all around the world um, uh, uh, to like a global audience and not something that just appeals to America. So they want it to be like, even if you don't know anything about the 80s um, uh, or pick up on any of those cultural references, it's still like a fun, fast, exciting, big action movie. And, you know treasure hunt in this virtual world where anything is possible so you can have amazing, you know, over-the-top fight scenes that you could never have in the real world. It has that kind of, uh, 
inception uh, level of uh, of uh, visual creativity that you can go with. That's why I'm really excited for the direct for for the director to get hired. We're still in the very early stages, but once the director comes on board and brings like whatever their visual you know whatever their vision is uh, uh, to the to the oasis, I'm really excited at you know what's going to happen. Just even seeing like early concept artwork and ideas of what will be possible, it gets me you know it, it gets me excited. So last question: At this point, you've written for stage, for movies, and now for books. What is your favorite experience, or do you even care? Is it just you just love uh, the variety of trying different things? Um, well, just you know, I uh, um, uh, like you, Brian. I love to geek out, and getting paid to geek out is like the best thing ever. Like I've been for such a big chunk of my life, I just uh, you know geeked out and, and did the things that I love to do just because I enjoyed them, and now I have a chance to do the same things and get paid for them. I've always wanted to make movies and be involved in. in making movies and, you know, uh, and, and video games. And now, like, I have a chance with Ready Player One to, to get to do both of that uh, uh, after having published the book. Now, it gets, you Actually, know, I, just, to, I just realized I lied know. because uh, I do have another question. You just mentioned uh, that you love video games. Is there any chance of a Ready Player One video game? Yeah, I mean, how amazing would that be? There's already, like, a really, like... Uh, small mini game that you can play on my website that's based on the Atari game that uh, that the protagonist creates in the book. But um, uh, working on a real Atari game uh, right now that's going to actually play on old school Ataris. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's based on uh, the game that Wade creates in the book. And, uh, and then, like, hopefully if the movie gets made... Um, my dream is that what Warner Brothers did for the Matrix movies, which was make the Matrix online as an MMO, that they would make the Oasis as an MMO, uh, hopefully maybe a little bit better than the Matrix online, which, you know, I dug. But um, and uh, uh, and then have that as a way to promote the movie. And then there could be a contest, an Easter egg hunt inside this MMO. Oh, my God. To, I know, dude. How amazing that would, be would that be? Amazing. Are you kidding me? Uh, all right. Well, the hardcover for Ready Player One is coming out on April 24th. Thank you so much, Ernie Klein. I'm sure we'll be seeing more of you in the future. Oh, thank you, guys. And hey, I'll be on both your podcasts. I'll be on. Uh, we get to share I, I, Ernie. <laughs> I, love, I, love, I love both of them. I'm a fan of Sword Laser. And, get uh, out! Uh, oh. Oh. oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'm all, like, blushy and, like. <laughs> anyway, was, thank was... you. That's awesome. We'd love to have you on sometime. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Go ahead. Take it away, V. All right, here at Game On, we pride ourselves on finding the voices in the video game industry that you want to hear from. Top newsmakers, whip-smart analysts, and behind-the-scenes heroes who make the games you love a reality. It is in that spirit that we introduce our newest correspondent, popular video game YouTuber, Daphne the Gamer Girl. Hey, you guys, so today... Hey you guys, so today I'm reviewing an older game that my ex-boyfriend gave to me. It's called From Dust. I wonder if it sucks as much as he does. Daphne, the gamer girl, girls rule. Okay, so the game is called From Dust and it came out last year. You're like God and you're trying to get your little people to not get killed by nature and stuff. I have a few points. First of all, you guys, the colors in this game are amazing. I just want to look at them and let them look back at me. Seriously, I feel like I can really get lost in them. Also, the music is pretty cool in and I wonder what it would be like if I lived in Whole Foods kind of way. I love Whole Foods. Point number two. Like my ex-boyfriend, the villagers in this game are way cuter when they're wearing masks. But then again, you never get to see the faces of the villagers since they're always wearing masks. My ex-boyfriend was just ugly all of the time. I wonder what else they have in common. Unfortunately, since they don't have a level where the villagers get to f*** that slut Jessica, I guess we'll never know. Jessica's a whore! Point three! Oh my god, you guys, I want this game to be like a calendar. This would be May. And this would be June because that's my birthday and I love dolphins and dolphins live in water. And this would be October because it's scary. Lava is where the devil lives. Point four. Oh no, my little mouse men are on fire. Sorry, you guys. Maybe I would have put it out quicker if you hadn't cheated on me. Don't cheat on Daphne. I will always love you. I know. Ooh, sizzling. Point five. Listen, y'all, this is a good game, but it does have its downsides. The trouble here is a lack of, and pardon the redundancy, intelligent artificial intelligence. Your villagers have a tendency to pick the most perilous and impassable routes that they can possibly find, which often leads to their own demise. In a game where nature is already stacked up against you, this can be very problematic. Listen, I don't want to go on a rant here, but I'm supposed to be God. Why can't I pick up their totem-loving unwashed keisters and put them somewhere safe? I mean, I can make oceans, create entire mountain ranges, and basically control the very forces of nature, but I can't pick up a 150-pound unwashed villager and put them somewhere safe? Hmm. 
The trampling of holy predestination in this game makes John Calvin look like a drunk tourist on the streets of Pamplona in early July. Sheesh. Also, the sound of the little men dying makes me miss my ex-boyfriend. Still not over it! So I totally like this game, and in between a daft yay and a daft nay, I'm totally gonna give this game a daft yay. What do you guys think? Good? Did you like it? Let me know in the comments. Do you think Jessica liked it? I didn't know you could still play games with your hands filled with my ex-boyfriends. Remember to subscribe! New videos every day, forever and ever! I guess some people like that kind of kind of uh, stuff. You know, you guys kind of look alike. I don't see it. Really? No. Hmm. No. An internet without websites is like a family gathering without a drunken prison story from your uncle. Let's all raise three cheers for Squarespace. Huzzah! 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 This episode is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. Squarespace.com has an easy-to-use UI for creating and managing a website or blog. Plus, it's optimized for both beginners and CSS experts. They recently created a developer-friendly CSS editor that allows you to pop out the entire window in full screen, colorize code, undo, find, and replace. There are hundreds of design templates to choose from, and you can customize any of the designs to fit your needs. They recently added 13 new template redesigns with 85 new style options and two brand new templates. There's tons of online resources and a special support team to give you personal help 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. For a free trial, go to squarespace.com and sign up for a free account. Make sure to use the offer code GAMEON2 to get 15% off for 6 months. That's squarespace.com and use offer code GAMEON2. That's GAMEON and the number 2. All right, so this week, Veronica, I started playing this game for iOS, and I thought it was such a brilliant idea. I thought it was a cool thing to try, but what I got was so disappointing, I couldn't even understand no. how far off it was from the high-minded concept for it. It was so far that I went on this fantasy of how they got there, how they strayed so far from the original idea that we put together something that's a segment we'll call It Totally Happened Like This. Now, it's time for Behind the Scenes. Brian, do you have any questions about the script? No, I, I should be okay. <clears throat> Hey everybody, it's Brian Brushwood from Game On, here to tell you about a new game called Highway Racer. Point is to avoid obstacles on the road and get to the end in the fastest time. Brian, Brian, we need to do another take. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, see, now the game includes a bunch of totally crazy elements that have no connection to the plot, like tidal waves and lightsabers and meteors. They come out of nowhere for literally no reason. Also, they changed the name of the game to Random Racer. Wow, just like that, huh? Just now on the phone. I added the new script to the Excel file. All right. <clears throat> Whoa, is that a lightsaber from the popular film Star Wars? Hell yeah, it's all part of the game Random Racer. Well, Brian, Brian, I just got a text. They want us to re-record. All the random stuff is now generated by your friends on Twitter. Also, the game is now called Twitter Friend Raceroo. That's a silly name. Silly name for a silly game. You should use that. You have my permission to use that. And go. Now your friends can ruin your gameplay experience from their phones with Twitter Friend Raceroo. Hold on, Brian. Hello? Sure. Brian, we needed to do one more take. Okay, they uh, seriously changed it again. Just tell me they at least stripped out the stupid pandering social media aspects, right? Now, all the tweets that make the completely unconnected random items affect your run are collected not from your friend list, but the entirety of Twitter's 100 million active users, effectively making it statistically irrelevant that anyone you've ever heard of will affect you at all, ever. Also, they've completely removed racing from the title. Now it's called Tweetland. Okay, so you're saying they're using Twitter as a less effective random number generator that triggered super repetitive obstacles over and over and over again, removing so much of what's fun about a racing game that they don't even put racing in the title anymore? New scripts in the doc. All right. <clears throat> Brian Brushwood here. Are you ready for lightsaber, love, monster, hashtag Justin Bieber, Viagra, Star Wars, discount, Star Trek? Okay, stop, 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 stop. These are just random buzzwords thrown together with no rhyme or reason. That's good SEO. Uh, listen, Brian, if you don't want to read the full script, just do the last line and we're done for the day. Tweetland, available for $2 in iOS. It's a silly name for a silly game. All right.
right? So to be fair, Tweetland is not a horrible game. It's just so far from the way they're marketing it. Number one, it's to $1.99, which is way, it's twice as expensive as most games on iOS, especially considering that so many good ones are totally free. Second of all, the gameplay is just not engaging. And the fact that you, that, that literally, it's, it, it oversells the idea that, it's, that it markets it like, ah, tweets just got real, stuff you tweet comes in the game. And plus, the whole reason that this popped up on my radar was because I tweeted out uh, something completely unrelated that had the word Twitter and game in it, uh-huh. and a robot said, you should try Tweet Land. It's an amazing <laughs> game. And so I gave it my best. I, I got to give it a thumbs down. I was very, it very disappointed. It looks terrible. It's, it's not a terrible. It it's looks just not very terrible. fun. All right. It's a, oh, yeah. Hey, all, all of a sudden, I'm ashamed. This game I'm that's not very fun is awesome. <laughs> it's no. totally worth the dollar ninety nine. I just paid for it. No, I will not say Tweet that land? at all. Really? Tweet, Tweet land? Yeah, no. All right. Well, we promised you at the beginning of the show that we would explain why Brian shaved Twit into the back of his head last week, <laughs> and to explain himself here is Glenn Rubenstein, the host of Shut Up and Play. What's going on, Glenn? How's it going, everyone? I'm Glenn Rubenstein, the producer and co-host of our LAM party, Shut Up and Play, and there is nothing shaved in the back of my head because I shut Mr. Brushwood out at Madden 2012 last week. Nothing Eight to yet. zero. Yes. He demanded a yet. replay. He demanded a rematch. And what was the score the second time? Uh, 28 to nothing. 28 to zero. <laughs> So tonight, we've got a grudge match. Mr. Brushwood and myself going head-to-head in Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo oh, HD Remix. Oh, man, and I got so the Clippers, sad. Brian. I'm coming for you, like, buddy. You don't understand. I actually wear my hair like Guile from Street Fighter. You are so dominated. Guile has two special attacks. Oh. It's, it's all on you. All right. Uh, okay, anyhow, if you want to get involved That's in our LAN party Sunday, February 12th, all you have to do is send an email to twitlamparty at gmail.com. We are going to be playing... Trackmania 2 Canyons, and for people that don't want to buy the game, we're also going to be playing the free version of Trackmania. We've got servers set up for both. It's going to be crazy racing action. It's going to be on, and Brian is going to have something new shaved in the back of his head because you're going down tonight, buddy. So you say, son. Look, of course, there wouldn't be a LAN party if it weren't for the fine folks over at Doghouse Systems. They are the company that provided these kick-ass gaming rigs that we'll be playing on tonight. In fact, they only make kick-ass machines. It's in the Constitution. Mm-hmm. So when you're ready to level up, use the code GAMEON at checkout, and they will double your memory for free. Think about how much more you'll be able to remember. So much memory. Just click on the banner ad on our Twit homepage to learn more about the Double Your Memory promotion. It's the Ginkgo Biloba of all promotions. So much memory. <laughs> I remember now. I love my doghouse system. I'm not just saying that because they're a sponsor. Oh, my God. I know. You You will not shut it's up got, It's it. got some, like, like it's got a little bit of a, like, a, like a jet engine yeah. thing going on there. It makes me a little like dizzy if I close myself in the room with it for a while, but it's it's awesome. All right. All right, well, I'll be an emu wrangler. This show is plain finished. Let's find out what our handsome and talented Twitter followers have to say about it. Chad? So, uh, Lonely G- Dot Geek says, in the House of Dead 2 uh, for Dreamcast, one of his favorite... Put, put it on your Chad Sorry. cam. There we, go. there we go. I can't switch and talk at the same it's time. very hard. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, he says, uh, House of Dead 2 for Dreamcast, his favorite mistranslation was, no, don't come in. No, it's actually, no, don't come, with an exclamation point. <laughs> no, don't come. Don't no, come. No, don't come. No. No. <laughs> Uh, also, um, uh, I can't read this guy's username, but he says, for any reason slash uh, uh, opinion, why Nintendo is never in the game news. Also, I'm writing this so Chad will be on at the end of the show. Yay! Thank you. And uh, Justin would like to note at the end of that, we mentioned we last week. We did. We did. Uh, look, we did. We're, not, we're not Nintendo haters. No. We're not Nintendators. I have to say, I'm I'm not usually a pink gadget kind of girl, but I saw the new uh, the pink DS. It's pretty awesome. Kind of into it. I got a DS not gonna XL. Lie. I started. Gonna I finally lie. finally got on the Scribble Knots train. It's awesome. <laughs> have you have you played Scribble Knots? I haven't. No. So good. All right. You could just write the I'll word vampire, and then a vampire shows up. Get out. Yeah. Anything. You How does it know? Elephants. It knows words. Technology. Well, all right, we'll cover it. In a it's amazing. Time. So the very last thing I have for you guys is Tony Hutch says on Xbox uh, uh, Gold membership. I don't like the fact that you need uh, need it for normally free services. Like, why should you pay to access YouTube? Mm. Ooh, good mm. point. All right, very clever. Maybe we could stir up the 99%. I think it's going to happen. I think more stuff is going to go free. Uh, I'm pro-free. I am also pro-free. Well, we'd like to thank everyone for tweeting, Ernie Klein for chatting us up, and 2K Games for giving us a sneak peek at Spec Ops The Line. Next week, we have Uncharted 3 sound designer Rob Preckle. We will see you guys then. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.
He's troll face troll lol troll. He's the troll Cave cave troll lol lol lol. T Tech in the chat says, Yo, dog. I heard you like trolls, so I'm gonna troll and you troll so you can troll on all. Why are you trolls? We made up the rest of that part. He just said, Yo, dog. I told you. We just went out with it. Oh, he's being angry the troll! He's trolling the troll! <laughs> Holy troll! Oh my god! Oh, that was that was impure! 